Hello and welcome uh, to this, our first major IPA event for 2023. Uh, Renee's very excited that we've got the largest number of people together since COVID. So welcome, uh, thank you for coming. My name's Brenton Caffin. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of Strategy and Policy uh, at the Department of the Premier and Cabinet. Uh, I'm also an IPA SA Councillor. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we stand on, on Tantania, the Red Kangaroo Place, land of the Ghana people, who are the traditional owners of the Adelaide Plains. The Ghana people are an enduring community with ongoing connections to country, including this space, where the traditional knowledge and practices inspire wonder and innovation. And particularly this week, when we've seen legislation introduced to the South Australian Parliament uh, for South Australia to again play a, a leading democratic innovation role um, to introduce a voice to Parliament, it's, I'm very, very excited to welcome Jack Buckskin, who's going to come up and give us a welcome to country. Please welcome Jack. Namani. Yes, how good is this? I remember, I literally, I remember doing that about 10 years ago and heard crickets. Like, nobody knew. We're, we're coming a long way, people understanding language and utilising it, and that's what we've been encouraging for a long time, so it's amazing to see, you know, even if that's, uh, if that's all we've got, it's so, it shows so much respect. I think all I've got, and my dad's Italian and Scottish, the only thing I can tell you in Italian is uh, mi chiamo Vincenzo, and that just throws people off sometimes because they think I actually do look Italian. Um, and then when somebody, if you do that, you show respect for somebody with Italian background. They keep talking to you in Italian, and you go, that's all I've got. You know, like it, it still shows respect. They laugh with you. Um, but for those that don't know me, I'm a, I'm a proud Ghana, Narunga, and Wirungal man. Everybody calls me Jack. It's not my real name. Um, it's just a cool name. Ganya Pundo Nuipin Akudnuiche is my name, which tells you... Uh, three things. It tells you the responsibility I have in our society and community uh, as Ghana people on Ghana country. Um, it tells you the responsibility I have as a father and also as a sibling. Ganya, it's my individual totem, which means the rock, and all of us have our own individual totems, which means that my responsibility is to care for that, and the person next to me is to care for their totem. So we're chiefs and kings of our own of our own lives and societies. Um, we don't really talk about. We don't have chiefs and kings, we have heads of families. And for today I get to welcome and represent my family here today as well. But um, in saying at the end part of my name is Kudnuitja, the third born in my, in my family. Uh, so I do have two older sisters um, that will constantly remind me I'm the baby brother and forever will be. Um, but the second part we get our name from our children to help them understand their responsibility as well. Pundundu is uh, my youngest born son. He's uh, Pundundu the dragonfly, so I've become Pundundu Ipina. So put all that together, Ganya Pundundu Ipina Kudnuicha, without touching the microphone and beeping it halfway through. Um, I didn't swear, that was just an uh, accident there. Um, but look, to, to acknowledge this place that we stand on, Marning Adul Tamperning Adul Garni Yartanga and the Yachi Yartanga Adul Tarna Ganya Takandi. As Brenton's already said, this part of the country is known as Tarndanya, which is the dreaming place of the big red kangaroo. And just outside, in front of the uh, convention centre, was the old sacred Tarndaganya, which, uh, uh, which was a gathering place for people from all over Australia to come for ceremonies a couple of times a year. Uh, that was actually quarried up, actually, uh, very early on, to widen the River Torrens to make it look like the Yarra, like we want to be like Victorians, but whatever. <laughs> Sorry for the Victorians in the room. No, I'm actually not. We don't like you, OK? <laughs> We love everybody else but you guys. Um, but it was quarried up to build the Holy Trinity Church across the road from the convention centre as well. So in a bit of sweet as well, it's, uh, they used the sacred rock to build a sacred place. So uh, for us, it's part of history. It's who we, who we are and where we stand. It's our duty as we walk along country to acknowledge the people that have gone before us, our traditional ancient ancestors to the modern ancestors that have gone before us. When we talk about ancestors, uh, there are families, communities and people that have gone before us, whether it's uh, physical people or beings. Um, and when we talk about ancestors, there's no Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal ancestors. Our, our spirits go back to the spiritual world. There's no Aboriginal spirits, non-Aboriginal spirits. We're all one people. 
and that's our duty as traditional owners to welcome you to this place to welcome you spiritually to this place surrounded by our ancestors all of ours um, in this place it's our duty to acknowledge as we walk country or as we gather on a place to think about them to acknowledge them because they are standing alongside us every day of our lives until we join them again so um, I welcome you on behalf of my family, community, and other Garna people. I pay respects to other Indigenous and Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people that are here with us today. Um, all the best. Uh, enjoy the rest of the afternoon. I'm not going to be sticking around and enjoying it. You guys, you nothing I put into you. You're going to enjoy the rest of the conference, I'm sure. I'm sneaking off because I usually fall asleep in these things. Last year, I was in this room for an artificial intelligence conference, paid $350 to go to it, and fell asleep in 10 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> all they talked about was data analysis. I thought we was going to learn about robots. Um, <laughs> so, have fun, guys. I tell you. Thank you, Jack. And um, if people are feeling um, uh, sufficiently courageous, you can join me in saying Natalia to uh, Jack for coming along today. Natalia. Right. Uh, well, let's get going. Um, a warm welcome to all of our speakers today, who I'm going to introduce shortly. Um, we appreciate you being here. Um, I need to acknowledge our major partners for IPA, the State Government Senior Leadership Committee and IPA sponsors. I'd like to welcome IPA's professional members and councillors for coming. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to UniSA and Kristen Alford, who's one of our speakers, um, for launching the Futurist in Residence program, without which we wouldn't have our international guest, uh, who I will introduce shortly. Um, We've got some housekeeping. Um, please place your mobile phones on silent, unless you'd like to become an accidental star. Um, please follow the signs to the nearest bathroom. If there is an emergency and we need to evacuate, please follow the Sky City staff as they lead you outside. Um, where possible, we would appreciate if you could avoid leaving during the presentations. Um, that said, we do understand that things come up. So if you need to leave, please try to do so uh, between speakers and activities. Um, so I thought I'd kick off uh, this morning's session with, with something I wrote uh, a little while ago. It seems quite relevant to the, the topic for today. Um, we live in a time of great uncertainty. The economics of the pandemic will continue to impact global supply chains and demand for our goods and services for years to come. We're entering into an era of more complex geopolitics in our region and the pressing need to decarbonize our economies will create both opportunities and challenges. Our working assumptions at the enterprise, the industry, and at the economy level will need to be continuously reevaluated if we are to navigate this uncertainty successfully. This was actually the pitch I made to come back into government 18 months ago um, to join DPC after a 15-year absence, um, what, during which I, I spent the world, the time running around the world helping governments to be more innovative. Um, I genuinely believe that um, the jurisdictions that thrive will be the ones that can anticipate and experiment their way through these complex waves of crises and challenges that will be facing us. Strategic foresight, which you're gonna, we're going to talk about today, is a, is a key tool in that, in that arsenal. Uh, and so one of the first things we did uh, once I, I was actually lucky enough to be given the job was to actually set up a strategic foresight team. And you're going to hear from Dr. Ariella Helfgott um, later uh, about the work that we're doing in South Australia. Um, this is, you know, you'll hear from others, but I, I genuinely believe that this is an opportunity for South Australia to really punch above its weight. Um, we're a small state, but we're an agile state. We've, we're an innovative state, we always have been, and we can get people around the table quickly to make things happen. Um, if we combine that with some clear-eyed view about the way that the futures may play out, not the singular future, but you know the different possibilities um, and how we can build strategies that are robust and resilient in the face of all of this uncertainty, then I believe that we can do a great service as public servants 
uh, to, the, to the population of South Australia, for our kids, uh, and so on. So we're really excited to be sort of putting on this event with IPA this morning to really share with you, sort of pull back the curtains a little bit about what does this strategic foresight thing mean? Who's doing it? What does it look like when it's been done really, really well? Um, is this just some fancy thing you can only do in Dubai or can we actually do it here in South Australia? And what does it mean on the ground um, when we actually sort of, you know, can we take this out into the regions, into the cities, into the Barossa um, and work with people to help us build our futures together? So hopefully today you're going to get some international inspiration, you're going to hear about our plans here in South Australia and you're going to hear some great examples of some work that's going on already here in South Australia to give you the confidence that this isn't just something random that we've made up. Um, this is a genuine piece of policy making kit for the 21st century. So with that, um, let me do my MC duties uh, and introduce you to uh, our speakers. So our first speaker this morning um, is Dr. Noah Rayford. Uh, Noah is a globally respected independent futurist who until October was the futurist in chief and chief of global affairs for the Dubai Future Foundation. As an advisor to the UAE's Prime Minister's office for many years, he was responsible for many global firsts, such as the Dubai Museum of the Future, the world's first 3D printed office, the Dubai block blockchain strategy, and more. Um, in my previous work, before coming back home, I, I worked with Nesta, which is the UK's innovation agency, and I had the privilege of traveling to many countries around the world and, and seeing what they were, were doing to try and in innovate their sort of policy-making practice. Uh, and I can say, you know, with, with you know, utter sincerity that, that Noah is one of a handful of people that I believe has actually changed the trajectory of national public administration in the country that he worked in for over a decade. Um, and we're really privileged to have him here to talk a little bit about that experience. Um, and uh, yeah, um, he also wants me to let you know he is a DJ, and that's very important. Please welcome Dr. Noah Rayford. Thank you, good morning everyone. It is, oh look at that photo. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I wanted to take the opportunity. I recently, as Brenton mentioned, retired from my role as a senior, senior civil servant in Dubai after about 12 years, starting first in the prime minister's office uh, and then creating something called the Dubai Future Foundation, which is essentially a state level uh, innovation agency equivalent to some of the work that you guys do. But uh, I wanted to start, raise a quick show of hands who's ever been to Dubai. Oh, a fair number of you, probably a, yeah, a third or a half of you. Uh, Dubai is a very interesting place to be thinking about the future, to be exploring the future, and in particular, what does that mean for policymakers such as yourselves? Because it's a place which has and continues to undergo dramatic transformation. As a nation, the UAE just passed its 51st anniversary. Um, I'm almost older than that. Uh, and as a city, truthfully, most of Dubai's development going from which was relatively basic economic conditions uh, in the late 70s and even up to the early 80s, has happened in the last 20, 25 years. And so it's a place which has a very intimate understanding of the impacts that surprising change can have, uh, how the best laid plans of, of mice and men can go awry, uh, and also has an inherent uh, sense of optimism for what can be done if you embrace the tools of change and try to engage with uh, you know, creating a better vision of what is possible as you go into the strange thing which we call the future. I uh, started working in the Prime Minister's office where I set up a national foresight and strategy team. Uh, and once I joined there, my boss, who was the cabinet minister, told me this was just after the financial crisis where the dust had settled and the blood had dried. And he said, that was the worst surprise of my life. I never, ever, ever want to have that kind of experience again. And your job is to make sure I never get surprised like that again. And if you can, help us identify some interesting opportunities that others aren't looking at yet and try to answer this question. If we've gone through all of this transformation in the last 20 years, what does the next 20 years look like? And I think we all share similar perspectives on this. This is not a great analytical mystery. 
these are just a few of the things which we were grappling with over the last decade in the UAE, but the truth of the matter is climate collapse is the thing that is going to be driving most first and second order change. And I very explicitly call it climate collapse because we are well beyond the climate change phase. All of our professional lives and certainly our children's lives will be spent dealing with the consequences of this. It's particularly relevant for the Gulf region because it's warming twice as fast as anywhere else in the world. And for the UAE, around 85 to 90 percent of its food is imported, 85 to 90 percent of its water is desalinated, uh, and it's subject to a high degree of heat stress, particularly the wet bulb effect, so when you have high humidity and high heat, which makes it essentially uninhabitable for several months of the year. This is also, of course, an opportunity because you can look at these challenges, at, which are just dramatic stressors to the existing supply chain, the existing way of interacting with nature, the existing way the economy is structured as an opportunity for innovation. And indeed, in the face of this, there's been extraordinary work on local agriculture, urban agriculture, more sustainable forms of produce, more efficient forms of desalination, et cetera. So while this is very much an existential threat, not just for the UAE, certainly for all of us, and this is an arid uh, environment here, it's something which is also a profound catalyst for reinventing the most fundamental aspects of our lives. The UAE, as my boss used to say, is in quite a rough neighborhood. You know, as Brenton mentioned, climate is going to drive large degrees of state failure and mass migration on the orders of magnitude, which we've never seen before, certainly in the history of, of our lives and most likely in the history of the 20th century. Uh, that is being exacerbated by the fact that we have the largest income inequality uh, in the last two years, really. Around 1% of the world is richer than 90% of everyone else. And there's an epidemic of, I think, perhaps justified depression, anxiety, anger, frustration, and blame for those who aren't in that 1% or might not have felt the benefits of globalization over the last several decades or borne the brunt of the last few years of changes. So that is going to continue to dramatize people's sense of conflict. That is uh, resulting, as we've seen, in senses of xenophobia, right-wing nationalism, populist movements, religious extremism. This is something which is occurring all around the world. Um, but given the interconnected nature of the Gulf and Dubai in particular, because it is this global hub of people, ideas, capital, infrastructure, and uh, influence, it's something which is quite sensitive to it. And of course, we, I'd be remiss if we didn't talk about technology, although I intentionally put this as the, the latter of the three. Uh, I'm sure by now if you are getting inundated with requests from your staff or bosses or children to tell you what tell them what ChatGPT is. Um, the truth of the matter is, in the last month or two, AI really has broken into the public consciousness. I gave a, a media interview a couple weeks ago and the, the presenter was asking me, what's the biggest thing that's gonna change our lives that we don't pay enough attention to? And I used to say AI, but now we're starting to pay attention to it. And this really is just the beginning, and I don't mean this in any techno-optimistic way, this really is the beginning of the beginning of the beginning of how automation is starting to really impact our lives. Previously, it's been stuck in factories and you know, uh, large data centers, but this is now something which is going to define your children's educational trajectory, it's going to define the rest of your professional careers, and really we have no idea how to manage it or what to do about it. Um, it's going to fundamentally reshape the nature of labor. So to answer this question, first starting the Prime Minister's office, we created a national foresight team that was very closely linked to the strategy unit and then but later became the innovation team and ran a series of traditional long-term studies, trying to understand what are the trends and issues and opportunities that we're facing. But Dubai is a very interesting place because it's very action-oriented. One of the cultural aspects of this rapid transformation is that words don't really matter as much as projects and activities do. So we spun out after several years and created something called the Dubai Future Foundation. So we went from the federal, the national level, to the state level. And that gave us a sort of interesting hybrid set of skills and capabilities. Uh, and I of, often used to describe the foundation as a bit of the premier's office, and that we had policy influence, a bit of Disney, and that we were telling really evocative stories, and a bit of DARPA, and then we were developing partnerships with technology, creatives, academics across sectors to come together and try to address this question, what is the future possibilities, what does it hold for us, how can we translate those into opportunities which inspire our bosses to believe in the possibilities of these changes and then translate those into projects. We didn't uh, start out so successfully, I have to say. 
Um, like many of us raised with, you know, masters in public administration or coming from a consulting background or coming from an engineering background, we're trained in delivering these. The job of the policy professional is produce reports, briefings, advisory. And I was very frustrated at the beginning when probably a year or two into set, having set up the team at the PMO because really we weren't getting much audience, like we weren't really getting much influence. And I thought, is this, is this just me? You know, or is, am I not communicating that well with my seniors? Am I not saying the right things? No, you know, we're doing good work and they said we were doing good work. And I realized actually it was the medium that mattered. And it wasn't just me, it was actually the way we were trying to engage our senior stakeholders. And I was encouraged by this slide, uh, by this graphic, which was a, an analysis of all the reports ever written by the World Bank. And it looked at how often were they read. And it's kind of encouraging or depressing, depending on how you look at it, that of all of the vast intellectual, technical, and financial resources that have been put into trying to solve the world's financial problems, only two-thirds had ever been read more than once. Right? One-third hadn't even been read once. And of the ones that had been read, almost 90% had only been downloaded and read 250 times or less. And there's something about the medium here that is not effective in a fast-moving, uncertain world to capture stakeholder attention, to build influence in such a way that helps them decide this is something that needs to be uh, on the agenda, and certainly doesn't translate into actionable activities or projects. So I thought, my background originally is in design, and we thought, how can we do this differently? And we used an event uh, called the World Government Summit to try to build, instead of a report or analysis of the future, let's build an experience of the future. And we worked with a variety of technologists and academics and researchers to see how these fundamental needs for which the public, is, the public sector is responsible, how does that translate and how will it be impacted into, uh, with these, these new types of emerging technologies? And most importantly, not just what are the techno-utopian potentials that these provide, but what might happen if we had, and this is a very optimistic, or one could even say prototypical, proto-utopian view, what happens if government, private sector, academia, and civil, service, civil society got together to actually resolve the challenges that these uh, present? And we just started building rooms and products and speculative experiences, such as this one, which is the future of healthcare. Well, it's kind of funny. It's actually a bathroom, and there were no signs, and we didn't have any technical reports, and we didn't have any uh, uh, jargons or buzzwords around this, but what we did was work with technologists and public health professionals to explore what might happen if you were able to take everything around personalized medicine, predictive, holistic approaches, and integrate that into your daily lives, and what we came up with was a bathroom. You wake up in the morning, you're brushing your teeth, your little mirror says, oh, Noah, you've been traveling a lot lately. You're not getting much sleep, and two of your friends have a cold. Your chance of getting the flu is about 30% higher today. Should I put some vitamin C in your breakfast this morning? All of this was an experience which you could interact with here, and what was interesting about this is that it was extremely more engaging, because for that to occur, we have to deal with a variety of policy challenges, not least of which is data privacy, data integration, the ability to deal with medical records, and even though we said all of this was speculative and fake, not real, this was an imaginative uh, instantiation of what might be possible in the future, because it was physical, because it was tangible and engaged your senses, people started really getting worried that we were scanning their data. At the summit, we have lots of heads of states and ministers and, and officials such as yourselves, and you can imagine how a minister or a, or, a, or a head of state would feel if they thought their medical records were being scanned in Dubai. Uh, so it provoked this kind of visceral response that created a window for policy conversation around these that the Ministry of Health or the Department of Health hadn't been able to get traction for for years. And the other thing that was quite interesting about this is we realized not only did this get the attention of policymakers and other stakeholders and indeed the public, but it helped shape their demand. They wanted the kinds of things that we were showing them. One example here is just this digital sand table in this uh, classroom of the future, which is just showcasing some fairly fundamental research about how young kids learn best. They're working together, play-based, interactive, dialogic. There are no teachers, no tests, no books. But when we showed this to the Ministry of Education, this is uh, the Prime Minister and members of Cabinet, he said, oh yeah, this is great, I, I love it. Let's do this, I'll take 300 of these. I said, you know, Your Excellency, I'm really sorry, we just explained this isn't real, this is a speculative experience. And he kind of looked at me like I was an idiot, and he says, you know, you, 
you, you built one, like build 300 more. And that was, again, on the back of years and years of conversation, technical reports about what's possible with the future, which gains very, very little traction. So our job very quickly became to create these kinds of experiences which explored hopeful and possible futures in a rigorous way, generated examples of what might be possible, and then use these Overton windows of interest to fulfill on the possibility that these provided. So I'll give one example here around uh, this moment of interest from leadership. This was back in 2014, back when drones were still sort of CIA assassination devices. They weren't in public eye. But as an example of mobile intelligent robotics, we thought, let's demonstrate this. I mean, it's also a bit of a, of a wild story to imagine how I could get permission to fly a drone in front of His Highness's face. But long story short, there was interest for this. And my boss said, what can we do with this? So I had my team go out and film this little speculative video of, of fulfilling a government service uh, delivery of a passport or a driver's license. He's renewing his driver's license here. This is the actual driver's license authority. She's printing it out, et cetera. We put it on a drone and we flew it and we put it up online on YouTube. It got three million views overnight. This was shortly after Amazon had announced their drone uh, delivery program and created a massive sense of public interest and support for this opportunity. So the next question became, well, what can we do with this window of opportunity that we've just generated? And so we launched this program called the Drones for Good Award, which was an international competition to get anyone in the world to submit prototypes and ideas for how you can use drones to improve people's lives. Well, funnily enough, there weren't actually any laws that allowed private citizens to fly drones in Dubai. So we get a call from the Aviation Authority being like, you know, this thing you just announced is illegal. It's like, yeah, but you know we work for the Prime Minister. I'm like, yeah, okay, well, what are we gonna do about it? So we helped them do a consultative process to create draft laws that would allow this competition to occur, and, and subsequently, we have a thriving commercial and civilian uh, drone use sector in the UAE, dozens of companies, hundreds of thousands of licensed operators, and this helped shift this, uh, this perception around emerging technology that could be quite scary into something which could be used for human benefit. So that's just an example, and I wanna share a couple more because uh, these illustrate the process and the lessons that we've gone through here around creating something that's interesting or identifying something that's interesting, talking about it in the media in a way that people can get excited by, and then gathering people together who are interested and inspired by that to build the momentum around that. I saw this, this is again in 2015 or so, I saw these little 3D printed sculptures of yourself in the mall. I'm sure everybody had been hearing 3D printing for a while. I thought, who is this? And I wrote up a little blog post about it. Some people emailed me. Some people came out of the woodworks from the university, some private sector companies, that there's some momentum here. Let's get together and talk about this. So we just hosted some meetings, not unlike this one, and we thought, what should we do? Well, let's make this official. So we announced the 3D Printing Innovation Alliance. No formality, there was no like registration of this. We just thought we're gonna get together and do this, which got more coverage and attracted more people, which started to generate interesting proposals and ideas from these passionate experts who wanted to explore this space that ended in a proposal from some of our major partners to build a 3D printed building. Now, when you have major international architects and engineers and technical capabilities already established through these friendships that you've made and they come to you with a solid proposal, that makes it very easy for you to turn around and get permission from your boss if you have a credible design, a budget, a timeline, etc. And so we went ahead and we built that. This is the 3D printed building, uh, floors, walls, and ceilings, entirely 3D printed. We, took about three times longer than we had anticipated and was about four times more expensive. Uh, I barely survived this project. But in the end, we delivered this. Now, yes, I have a background in architecture, but I, I'm, a for, I'm a futurist. It's not like there's anything particular special about this. Think about this as a metaphor for the sectors and areas that you work in. And when we launched this, what was interesting was, again, it garnered international press, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in coverage just because it was an exciting idea that blew people's minds. And when it was opened, Prime Minister said, great, you've built one, where's the next 10,000? Well, turns out it's technically illegal to use 3D printed cement because there are no building codes for it. You see, the, see the pattern here, all of the most interesting experimental things which you need to test out through action in order to understand the questions that need to be asked in order to draft the regulations and policy that need to be written can't be done unless you have this kind of high level support. Uh, and you do them. And so technically this building was permitted as a tent it then led to the creation of 3D printed building material codes for the municipality and the launch of this, of this 3D printing strategy which set a very ambitious vision, 25% of every single building would be 3D printed or robotically uh, constructed in Dubai by 2030. Now, 
You may or may not hit that vision, but because of this process and by setting these targets, we attracted over 20 different companies to set up shop in Dubai. It's now one of the most thriving, robust uh, clusters of, of economic or construction innovation in the world and has a whole host of expertise and jobs that never would have come there, right? Starting from this little thing in the mall with a foresight perspective. Similar approach with doing this with blockchain, gathering, gathering our network together, doing prototypes, telling the story, getting feedback from that, launching ambitious stra uh, uh, strategies, excuse me, um, autonomous transport, uh, green energy, et cetera. I'm gonna go a little bit faster here, but um, there are many lessons which I'd like to share with you from this. One, it's easy to dismiss this as, oh, well, just Dubai has a lot of money, or everyone just has to do what the boss says in Dubai. Um, I, that couldn't be further from the truth. The truth of the matter is right now is that, uh, is that there is more money available in the world than there has ever been in the world. What is missing are really exciting ideas coupled with the confidence that they can be accomplished. And if you're in a commissioning, commissioning role or you're trying to convince your boss to try and explore these new ways of doing things in your sector or your department, money is not the problem, right? Ha partners are not the problem. It's finding good ideas and structuring those ideas in such a way that are plausible and build com confidence for them that they can take this risk without losing their job that, uh, that is the real challenge. I mentioned the Museum of the Future that we started at. My baby for the last eight years has been the construction of the Permanent Museum of the Future. And parallel to all these projects, which I showed you and many more, the Permanent Institution was being built. It opened last year, in fact, almost a year ago. Um, yeah, a year ago this month. We're about to have our millionth visitor. Uh, it's this gorgeous structure on the side of Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai. It's the biggest experiential futures experience in the world. But it says something about starting in this tiny little exhibition, which I guarantee you was far less expensive than, the McKin than a McKinsey report. And 12 years, well, eight years later in this case, the whole orientation of the Dubai government, indeed the UAE government, has shifted towards a proactive engagement with the future using experimentation and prototyping with a network of partners as the means to discover what is worth doing and learn from those discoveries and build confidence in the other stakeholder groups and investments in this area make sense. Uh, and, and it's one of the capitals of the, of the future. It's one of the capitals in the world. Now, of course, I've been very privileged to play a very small part in this. I can't claim credit for almost any of this, but I have learned some important lessons, and I just want to share this with you before I wrap up in my final minute. This process, it sounds very simple, but it's not that easy, but it's also not very expensive and not very hard. It starts with envisioning an inspiring future. Sounds kind of basic, but how much of your policy work, how much of your exploration of the trends and challenges of, the, of your department are actually genuinely inspiring, hopeful, and optimistic? In my case, for the previous policy work I did, not much. You're not trained to generate hope and optimism. You're trained to be a technocratic policy analyst or a bureaucrat. But that doesn't move the souls of men, as Goethe said. So you have to start with something that is genuinely inspiring and that you want your kids to experience or you would actually like to experience. And you use the media to talk about that. Just talk about that as small or as big as you can. And that will become a signaling device that will attract people who are also passionate and inspired by that idea. And you just start getting together having meetings like this one. Start having meetings. And out of those meetings, exciting proposals will emerge. And you use those proposals and the credibility of the partners, academics, private sector, other members of government, to generate political confidence that these are executable, that this is doable. That lets you get these projects approved and delivered, which lets you tell even bigger stories than media about it, which lets you set even more ambitious targets and scale the most successful projects. And you do it again, and you do it again, and again, and again. This is a foresight way of thinking about policy, but there's nothing particularly rem remarkable about the methodologies and techniques used therein. This is about how do you do innovation in government under times of dramatic and ra radical change. But if you don't do this, you will be boring, you will not be reelected, you will not be promoted, and you most certainly will not be fulfilling your public duty for helping position your department, your state, or your country to be fit for the future. I'm gonna, uh, and with just these really quick lessons. Um, 
boldness and sexiness. Not often we think of our jobs as being bold, sexy civil servants. We did a workshop with some friends in California where we called ourselves the fantasticrats, much better than the bureaucrats. But that is powerful. And those sexy, bold visions need projects to make them real. And funnily enough, the bolder and more ambitious the project is, the more likely it is to get funded and, and, and uh, approved. No one has time for small incremental change anymore. But the way to help shape this is by telling bold stories with bold, sexy proposals. They're proposals. There's nothing wrong with talking about the proposal, the possibility, the idea. But once our bosses, certainly in a, in, in a political context, start to see that people are excited about this and there's credible players, the chances of approvals go through the roof. There's a whole other talk around how one executes effectively. I, I won't get into that in detail because I'm already like 35 minutes over the deadline for this. Um, but this helps build the momentum to scale to larger impacts. I just will say that this is not the way we as civil servants have been trained. Right? In order to do this well, it requires, in the case of the 3D printing office, rule bending, loophole finding, partnership and coalition building. You need permissions for that. And that requires a certain sensibility that is more akin to a policy pirate than to a bureaucratic manager. Now, that's not all our comfort zones, and that's OK. But there are people in this room who are world-class ninjas at performing these kinds of activities. Uh, I will call up Brenton, Ariella, Kristen here, who can help you. And I think, in my experience, if you dig a little deeper, too, we all like to be a little bit like a pirate. It's exciting. It gives us a sense of agency. It gives us a sense of activity and impact on the world, which is the most important thing when we face dramatic change, because otherwise, we're most likely to be terrified and paralyzed by our sense of not being able to do anything. I'm going to leave it here, but I will just say the world is literally falling apart. It's not the first time, however. We are entering a civilization scale crisis, and these crises require technical solutions, but it's not the technical solutions which are going to get them through that, through this. It, it requires bold acts of social imagination. And we've gone through this before. Like in the United States with the Great Depression, what did we? Created the Works Project Association. We invented the New Deal. We created all of the infrastructure that made America great for a couple of decades. After the horrors of the Second World War, we invented the United Nations. This was an act of social imagination, envisioning a better future and designing a prototype of it today, and so on and so forth. I'll just leave you here because, again, as I mentioned, I'm way overdue. But I want to leave you with these words of encouragement that this is totally possible. This is very exciting for your bosses. This is very exciting for the public to see that their government and their civil servants are thinking about the future and engaging it in exciting ways. And you have a variety of extraordinarily capable partners already here in government through Branson and his team and others in, at MOD and, and UniSA who are happy to help you. So I encourage you to be bold, be sexy, take risks, and get things done. Thank you. All right, who's feeling pumped and ready to be bold and sexy? Show our hands, go on. Here we go. Noah, you've done your job. Excellent, thank you. Um, look, hopefully you've seen now um, just why we, we feel that's such an inspirational story and really tangible um, methods for putting this into practice. Um, it actually reminds me of a, of a quote which, which we shared um, early on in the pandemic um, by a guy called Eric Hoffer who said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And I think the last few years, you know, the, the world has changed. Things we thought weren't possible have become possible. Thought we think, things we thought were too hard have become essential. And, and things that we put off, you know, like telehealth, suddenly are right here in front of us. And actually, my experience, again, working with, with a number of governments around the world is we've probably underestimated our ability to, to be bold and put some of this stuff into practice. So I think the last few years, while they've been exhausting, have also hopefully given us some confidence that actually we can, we can make stuff happen. We're going to move on. Um, our, our next speaker um, is going to um, bring all of this into the South Australian context. And as Noah said, we are really privileged to have uh, Dr. Ariella Helfcott, not just here this morning, but also working um, in my team at DPC. 
Um, Ariel has been doing this work for 20 something years in a range of sectors, defense, energy. Yes, I know, it, the, you've, you've, you've moved jobs, it's all, it's all good. She's now the Director of Strategic Foresight at the Department of Premier and Cabinet. She was Director of Scenarios at the World Energy Council up until uh, last year. Um, Ariella um, has a demonstrated history of working across disciplines, across sectors and social worlds to achieve sustainable and equitable futures. Uh, she undertakes multi-actor collaborative action research, supporting systemic transition processes. And her research spans conceptual and mathematical models, modeling of system resilience and adaptability through to participatory approaches to building resilience and adaptive capacity on the ground. Please welcome Ariella. I was about to come up here and say, I'd like to complain about being set up to follow Noah talking about the Emirates to be me talking about South Australia, but actually it was the perfect setup because it really should have stretched everyone's thinking about what is possible in this space. And yeah, I'm ready to be bold and sexy. <laughs> so I'm just gonna learn how to use this. I also wanna begin just with this acknowledgement because I feel a deep reverence for the fact that we are meeting on Ghana land and that this land was never ceded and to personally acknowledge the leadership of elders past, present and emerging. So the motivation for setting up a strategic foresight unit inside the government of South Australia was also set up perfectly by NOAA. It was the acknowledgement that we're living in this era of really fast and fundamental changes that have very uneven impacts across geographies and across generations. All of the things that Noah mentioned that are happening in the UAE, we're also wrestling with the impact of climate change, with digitalization, with decarbonization, with decentralization, with lots of demand side disruptive innovation and social change, all of these things are happening here. Um, and so all of those changes are really outpacing governments all over the world and strategic foresight can help us build that institutional adaptive capacity to be able to keep up. So our vision, for the Foresight Unit for South Australia was that the government of South Australia would be able to keep pace with all of those social, economic, environmental, political changes happening everywhere and how they affect us and be able to create strategies, policies and plans that would really enable South Australians to create prosperous, thriving, healthy futures for themselves. We didn't want to just be doing the strategic foresight ourselves. The vision is that every single government agency has these foresight capabilities and really actively engaged in doing their own foresight as they're developing their own strategies, policies and plans. And that the foresight unit in DPC is just the beating heart of a collaborative learning community across government. And that all of those insights are being fed in, we're able to join all the dots and, and feed things back and synthesise and um, be developing ways to support a constant learning across government in this space. That's the vision. We have to start where we are. So the way that we got started um, was by meeting people where they're at in the public service here in South Australia, in their day jobs. Uh, I have been doing foresight work for 20 years in different countries and I can honestly say there is something about foresight appetite and how much people are ready to engage with, with crazy stuff. And there's definitely a big appetite for that in Dubai. And here it was a matter of not wanting people to have amazing foresight experiences and then go home and go, well, that was really interesting, but now I have to just go and do my actual job. Um, this is core. It's a core function and it needs to be part of everyone's day job. And there are a lot of people right now who are involved in doing 20 or 30 years strategies, plans and, and policies that are gonna even play out in that time frame. So we got ourselves involved in every 20 to 30 year strategy, policy or plan and try to help people figure out how they could incorporate strategic foresight into the process of developing those things so that they would be future ready. And um, since my job title has changed, since what was up on the board there, it's been a year. And in that year, we've done so many of these long-term strategy and policy processes. So the things that are up on the board there, we've been helping uh, planning and land use services redo all the 30-year plans. We're in the middle of that at the moment. We've been helping Infrastructure SA with the 20-year infrastructure plan strategy, sorry, energy and mining with uh, scenarios about the future of energy transition in South Australia, environment and water with long-term water security strategies that you'll hear more about. I actually can't even list all of them, but so, so those are a taste. 
Um, and for the people in the room here who are still thinking, I've just heard a lot of exciting stuff, but I'm still not sure how this does relate to my day job, I thought I would take a minute to just say, you know, when we're talking about foresight, we're talking about the future. And there are basically four kinds of questions that we can ask about the future. One of them is the what could probably happen question. And that's where all the data and mathematical models and trends and projections comes into it. And that is useful information that we also need. In times of a lot of disruption and turbulence and uncertainty, those projections can become um, less useful and sometimes even dangerous if they blind us to what else is going on. Then there's another kind of question which has nothing to do with data, which is what do we want or not want to have happen? And that's the, the normative visioning question. It's what Noel was talking about when he was talking about the actual first step being to be able to create an inspiring vision of a positive future that we can all actually get behind. And it is true that even though it's probably the most vital step in the policy process, it's the one that's most missing. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's not about data, that's about creating safe spaces for people to get in touch with their deepest values and be able to really articulate types of future they would actually like to live in. The third type of question is what could possibly or plausibly happen, whether we like it or not, and even if it's very unlikely, but if it did happen, it would be really important so that we're not blinded to the spectrum of uncertainties that are about to cross our path and so that we can make those strategies and policies that are robust and resilient, as Brenton was saying right in the beginning. And the fourth step is the what are we going to do about it? And in my experience here, and actually elsewhere in most places except places like the Emirates, most people are jumping into the what are we going to do about an issue before doing any of the first three types of question. So it's the job of the Strategic Foresight Unit to help put those questions into, into everyone's day jobs here. Yeah, so when you're making a strategy, a policy, or a plan, there's some objective that you want to reach. And you can work backwards from that objective to figure out what would be the steps that you would need to take to be able to achieve that outcome, the desirable outcome. When you've got a lot of uncertainty, those different tubes are meant to be different scenarios. They have different challenges and opportunities in them. So the steps that you might need to take to achieve a desirable outcome will be different in all of those scenarios. And by thinking that whole process through, we can come up with what are the sets of actions that are robust in the face of all of that uncertainty that we could systematically consider? And what are the new innovations that we come up with in these different contexts when we go outside of our assumptions just about what we thought the future was going to be like because we've really, really engaged with the types of change that we could be facing. Also, the Foresight Unit has been doing deep dives, like, so not just the long-term strategies and plans, we've been doing deep dives into current, very evolving, real-time issues of relevance. So we've helped the Office of Hydrogen Power SA do scenarios about the future of hydrogen in South Australia. Um, we did a set of water energy scenarios for the state we help Treasury and Finance do a deep dive into the possible implications of a global economic downturn for South Australia. And we're about to, next week, do a really huge whole of government net zero green economy scenario process that I'm really excited about. As well as all of that, we're also developing sets of foundational foresight products. So we've got our own types of horizon scanning, we've got our own megatrends analysis, and we're developing an AI scraping tool that can help us look for weak signals, a uh, horizon scan survey, and we also synthesize from all the foresight that we're doing, what are the critical uncertainties that are coming up everywhere through people in all the agencies. We're setting up a radar also to pick up weak signals. We will integrate from all the scenario work that we're doing a set of statewide scenarios and a set of scenarios for the future of Greater Adelaide. And we'll develop a, a dashboard for how we're tracking. All those things have prototypes that are being piloted and iterated, and the goal is to have them all up on our website by the end of the year. We'll have plenty of things to show you in the meantime. We're definitely a bit behind the Emirates at the moment. One year in, I'm still feeling pretty proud of where we're at. Um, I'll skip that one. Yeah, so I think probably the most important thing out of everything that I have to say is that we're developing a community of practice. So this has gone from me at the beginning of last year to um, those photos are of 40 to 50 people that self-identified as strategic foresight or futures practitioners in South Australia who came to our community of practice drinks that Kristen and I co-hosted on Tuesday night, so just this Tuesday, and Noel was there. And I think it must be a testament to the impact of 
thinking through different plausible futures and the actions that we might need to take if we want to avoid negative outcomes and steward things towards more positive outcomes in terms of building hope in people that are engaged in it because Noah asked everyone to arrange themselves in the room along different axes and one of them was how much hope and agency do you feel that we can create a better future here in South Australia? And if you feel positive about that, go to the right. And literally everyone in the room went to the right. So that was pretty special. Um, I actually have a QR code that I'll flash up now for anyone in this room that wants to join the community of practice, because we're hoping that you will. And if you, even if you just bring up the link, it'll give you the opportunity to sign up so that even though our website's not full of all those products yet, we will be sending them to you as they become available and you'll be invited to events like this and events like the Foresight Community Drinks and, and we'll keep you up to date on everything. So those are our main types of activities, the foresight that we're doing ourselves as a unit, the foresight that we're empowering other agencies to do and making these flagship foresight products. What strategic foresight is not is a report. It's a really, really targeted intervention. I feel like there's more, it's more than a substitution of tools. You know, so building this capacity for foresight across the government in South Australia is actually a cultural change. You know, in terms of the way that we embrace uncertainty, the type of culture that we have to be bold and sexy, all of these types of things that, um, that Noah was talking about. And, and everyone in this room who's interested in it will find themselves in the midst of that culture change. We have some principles of what is going to help foresight catch in government, which is, if you're doing it, make sure that it is embedded in broader policy processes so that everybody can see the what and the why of it. Um, we do our best to use a mixture of narratives and quantitative analysis to build legitimacy and also different types of visual descriptions of the foresight that we're doing. We try to engage the people that we want to use the scenarios in the process of making them. So all of these types of things have helped along the journey. Overall, the hope is that all of this work will lead to increased capacity in the government of South Australia to be able to cope with the turbulence, uncertainty, novelty and ambiguity that we know that we're facing and to be able to anticipate and even benefit from systemic risk. And um, yeah, when I look around this room right now, I feel very hopeful. Excellent. Thank you, Ariella. Um, so, you started to think sexy and bold. You started to know that there's actually stuff going on here on the ground. And you may be wondering, what happens if I don't have 20 years of experience in strategic foresight? Well, our next speaker is going to help to both ground this work in some real stuff that's going on here in South Australia, and hopefully to give you confidence that this is something that everyone can have a role in. So Dr. Ashley Kingsborough is the manager of water security with the Department for Energy and Water. Ashley is an environmental engineer and policy advisor who's worked on water resource management and climate change adaptation projects in Australia, the UK, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. He has more than 15 years of experience in the water sector across consulting, government, and academia, and he's interested in addressing complex water resource management problems using innovative methods and putting climate adaptation into practice. And Ashley's going to walk you through the experience uh, the, of the project that they did in the Barossa and their long-term water security. Please welcome Ashley. Thanks, uh, Brenton, and um, nice to be here this morning. So, yeah, as, as Brenton set out, um, and, and Noah and, and Ariella, you know, there's, there's lots of these really huge ideas, uh, but I guess my experience was you've got to start where you're at. And so this is a bit of our experience um, on a project we started just over two years ago to develop a long-term water security strategy for the Barossa. So, well aware, everyone's not going to be interested necessarily in water security in the Barossa, but hopefully I can draw out some lessons learned and some of the things that we learned that we we're able to put into practice along the way so that you might be able to apply them in your roles. Cool. Um, so, why, why, why were we doing this? Why a water security strategy in the Barossa? Well, really, you know, we were able to see that there were these long-term trends on the horizon. Um, we were also able to see that really in the, in the space that we work in, we have these short-term plans in place, 10-year plans, but really they weren't integrative. And they were really shifting the needle on some of the work that we knew needed to be 
shifted. And so water in a state like South Australia, it's a fundamental issue. It's a fundamental issue for agriculture, uh, but more generally for the state. So we needed to ensure that there would be safe, affordable water now and into the future. Because we know that we have these iconic regions of our state, and we know that they are critical to the story, the imagination, how we see the future of South Australia. But we know policy alone doesn't necessarily uh, deliver the outcomes we need. And we've had some challenges, I guess, ourselves. When we look internally, there's always complexity within government. And we weren't seeing alignment between the policy solutions and delivery on the infrastructure perspective. So it's bringing, about bringing those conversations together. And it's to support that long-term regional economic growth. And these weren't just things that I was thinking about. These were, these were the issues that were front of mind for our stakeholders at Barossa Australia, the Grape and Wine Association, growers, people who drove tractors for a living. They can see these things on the horizon, and it was up to us to move forward with this agenda. Um, and so I guess climate is changing. We're, we're well aware of that. Everyone we're working with is well aware of that. And so that, was, that loomed large. I guess that becomes as a key driver for why we do long-term strategy. Uh, but we're also aware that the ecology of many of the regions of South Australia is in quite steep and serious decline. So we've got the climate changing, we've got our ecological environments uh, in, in a lot of trouble, but then we can also see at a broader scale there are these global megatrends. And so those two things are going to intersect, and they intersect in place. And so what we, I guess why we're developing a water security strategy for Barossa, because it's a place-based intervention, and one of the key things we found was around, what is the right scale? Because we've done broader scale water security planning across government previously, and just didn't have traction this time we found a scale, we found a community of people and ideas and ecologies that have worked. So these were some of the, uh, the bigger um, long-term risks and challenges that our stakeholders in the Barossa were able to identify and that we addressed through our strategy development. Now you've seen this, this slide earlier from Ariella and, and it's worthwhile thinking about here because two years ago we stepped back a little bit and said, you know, what are the methods that we can use to start to address some of these really, really big challenges? We did a bit of a scan around the world and said, you know, th there are a lot of benefits of a foresight-based approach. And the reason is that we are, we were a group of actors in the present, okay? We, we know that there is this challenge, but that vision piece, and I think Noah picked up on that, that vision piece wasn't always done. And so we spent a long time working with our community. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit because I think it's important around visioning and why we went through a process of visioning. And I guess my bias here is uh, engineer by training, as, as, as was mentioned. And so definitely a tendency to go towards models, things like that, projections. But it doesn't capture all the uncertainty because we don't fundamentally know how the future will pan out and it is worthwhile being robust because we know that small interventions now in the next five years may ensure that we have that robustness off the, across that broader range of scenarios that could well eventuate. So it's a small investment in the next five to 10 years that could deliver those really long-term benefits. So nuts and bolts, this is, this is a bit of a detailed slide, but this is really just to say, well, so how do we actually do this in practice? How do we go from the ideas? What did we do? So we ran a series of workshops, three workshops for us to develop the strategy. It was a, across approximately an 18-month period. We had probably 50 to 60 stakeholders involved um, in each of those workshops. The first workshop really was about establishing that vision. It was also about saying, well, what are the types of actions we could do to achieve that vision? And then what are these shared and collective uncertainties that we know we need to address? In between that period, we then stepped aside and said, well, okay, we've got these uncertainties, how do we build up scenarios? And so we were able to work with, with Ariella and, and her team in terms of fleshing out, well, if we have all these important and uncertain factors, how do we build them into narratives of the future? Because narratives are important, they create the stories that resonate with people. And I guess we haven't, uh, we've started where we've started, and we haven't been able to, I guess, develop some of those audio visuals, videos, movies, experience, but stories actually resonate with people as well. And so storytelling is part, and, and obviously I'd love to be moving into some slightly more exciting storytelling in the future as well. Um, but then we also needed to check some of the reality of these things, because understanding the proportionality of interventions is really important around having traction. So 
Uh, yes, we, oh, sorry. Yeah, we need to think about these really broad range of futures, has been our experience. But if you're saying, well, here's a proposal, here's a proposal, it's really, what's the proportionate impact of some of those different interventions? And some things are suited to being quantified and some aren't. But it doesn't mean either of them are more or less valid, but we do need to find a way to bring them together. So that's what we did, I guess, outside of a workshop setting. And we came back again to our community. We shared our ideas. We stress tested them with our stakeholders to see if they resonated. Did they make sense? Because it's not a strategy for us, this was a strategy for the Barossa region. Just going to dig down into the visioning piece here a little bit, just so it makes sense. So we had 40, 40 or 50 stakeholders in a room. We asked those people, they were, they were farmers, they were grape growers, they were people who live in the Barossa, they might have been in local government. Um, what are the most important vision elements for you about the future? And I don't know, it's not a good workshop unless there's some sticky notes and some red dots. So we then ask people, yep, sticky note up right away, let people create their own perspectives, but then share them. And so we were able to do, I guess, a visioning process here where we could say, what are your, what are your key elements for the future? What, what do you want to see? What, if you had agency and you should have agency, how do you see the future of this region? And there's a lot of uh, commonality when you do that. There's, there's themes, and those themes came out. We used some sticky dots to vote on what, what the key elements were going to be there. Um, and this, this, I guess, is, is, a, is a short version of what that vision was, the, the kind of the dot point version for a, for a presentation like this. But really, for, for the community, they, they see themselves as a thriving regional agricultural community, but they acknowledge that there is change and there's things that need to be overcome. Um, and so I guess we've got this version of the vision, I won't read through it, but I guess to complement this, we also developed a story. And so a whole page in our strategy is dedicated to a story, and it's a narrative version. So there's many ways you can kind of think about a vision and how you can communicate that, because I dare say different things are going to resonate with different audiences at different times, and I think it's incumbent on us as the kind of policy people to have them all in our back pocket and be able to whip them out when we need them. Um, this by no means is for you to try and be able to read, but is to try and demonstrate that we also work in really complex systems. So we've got the, the socio-political complexities, but even just the water system, it's complex in its own right. And so some of the innovation here that we're able to bring in was bringing together our understanding of a groundwater system, a surface water system, how that's all changing in a changing climate, how the demand for different products in the Barossa also interacts with this. And so by building these tools, it means we can assess the different proportionality of different interventions now or how we might sequence them into the future. Uh, I'll just highlight up here some of the, um, I guess, key elements of the strategy. The point of that here is really to say that that top tier are probably the types of things that we would expect to see in a water security strategy. They might exist in a water allocation plan, something along those lines. It's about improving ecological outcomes, it's about doing better land management, it's about being able to align the supply and demand of water into the future. But then we look at the supporting pillars of the strategy there. They are things that wouldn't inherently have come out, I don't, I don't think, if we hadn't used a foresight-based process. And it's really around what are the governance mechanisms, what are the ways of, of, of working that we need now that, that, in all honesty, it's not how we're working at the moment. How do we work together differently and more effectively? How do we bring in these, I guess, ideas around business innovation and diversification? Because there's business innovation at many levels. And we were working with some really creative businesses in the Barossa, and they said, no, we're part of the water security st story. And we were like, OK, this is great. How do we bring you along? And that's also about that next generation, because labour shortages are real and having the right types of people in the regions of South Australia to ensure those regions can be thriving is really, really front of mind. And so that's part of the world security story as well. So that's why I think that's where some of the value comes in from having these broader conversations, not just necessarily getting a bunch of uh, agronomists and engineers in a room. Talking about getting people in a room, um, it needs breadth. Okay, and so this is just to give you an example of, of some of the people who have championed uh, the development of this strategy and the adoption of a foresight-based approach. We see multiple tiers of government, we see utilities, we see local industry associations. And because, as I mentioned before, I don't see this as, as a strategy of the department. Department doesn't need to have a strategy, the region needs to have a strategy. But we needed to be 
be able to bring people along for the journey um, to develop it. And really, that means we've got a really, really firm basis and foundation now as we go into implementation, because strategy for the sake of strategy is, is, is useless, but we need to be able to really do that initial work, I think, so that we can start putting these things into practice. Uh, there's a, well, if you need it, uh, there's a little bit more information. Uh, but yeah, I guess there's some of my team here today uh, uh, over in the corner. Um, but yeah, happy to answer any questions um, that you may have offline. Thank you, Ashley. I think it helps sometimes to ground this into like real examples that maybe sort of, you know, feel quite similar to the sort of work that we're all doing in our, in our day jobs. And I think for me that, um, and, and I should say, apologies for the, some of the slides were um, out of whack. That wasn't Ashley's fault. We did a late laptop swap. Um, I think the, the important thing for me is um, so often when we think about citizen engagement, stakeholder engagement, um, consultation, um, all too often it, it comes after we've done a lot of the thinking work in our, at our desk and we've done the strategy, we've certainly done the version 0.1, and you're already into a kind of a trying to explain or defend what you've come up with. And I think what we see here is the value of actually going into a room and starting the conversation with people and using that to inform the strategy development and the policy development process. So um, this is, you know, as we've said a few times, I, I think this is a really, really core piece of um, the policy making kit that we can take forward. I'm conscious we've done a lot of talking at you. Um, if you need to shake it off, shake it off. We've got one more and then we're gonna move into a slightly more interactive process and there will be time to ask questions of any of the speakers um, after we've done that workshop. But if you need to give yourself a wriggle, give yourself a wriggle. No, okay. Um, I'm gonna introduce our last speaker um, and we are indeed um, blessed with a lot of talent in South Australia. Dr. Kristen Alford, who I'm sure is known to many of you in the room, is a futurist and she's a director of MOD, who you've heard um, referenced a few times um, this morning at the, the University of South Australia. MOD is an immersive museum of discovery, a place to be and be inspired. Uh, Kristen leads a team dedicated to creating dynamic changing exhibitions, showcasing the edge of knowledge and the emerging technologies. Um, prior to this role, Kristen was the founding director of Foresight Agency Bridge 8, facilitating futures and engagement on water sustainability, nanotechnology, health, manufacturing, clean tech, climate, lots of stuff. Um, Kristen brings, I think, a really interesting um, uh, perspective on not just the policy question, but also how do we engage the public in questions of the future and building futures literacy. But on this, ex um, on this occasion, she's going to explain some work that she did with the Defence Innovation Partnerships. Please welcome Kristen Alford. Thanks, Brenton, and thanks for having me. Um, I was asked uh, when we sat down this morning, what's the title of my talk? And I, to be honest, I hadn't thought about it, but actually when I thought about what I wanted to share with you, the title of my talk was really how to be a good client. Like how, if you're bringing foresight into your, into your work, how, how do you receive that in a way that's gonna be most effective? So that's really what I wanted to talk about today is really, you know, as Brenton said, my background, um, before I was director of MOD, I did a lot of work into state government, helping people do foresight um, in bits and pieces. Um, and so I wanted to reflect a little bit on that and use the Defence Innovation Partnerships as a really great example. Um, and for those of you who know Suman Rai, who's the Director of Defence Innovation Partners, she is an excellent client. Um, so I wanted to shout out to Suman as well. Um, so the first thing I wanted to show was this, um, this picture here. And this comes from um, MOD, where we are Every couple of years, we run a thing called the Future Themes Forum because we want to put on exhibitions and programs that are really relevant to what people think about the future and what they care about. And the only way we're going to do that is be able to have conversations with them. So I really like this image of, you know, of, of people across a wide range of ages and expertise deep in conversation um, around what's important to them when they think about the future. And the work that we often do in futures comes from this really engagement in those discussions. And so this particular process is done through open space methodology where we're bringing people in and they're leading conversations. Um, and that's really because when we think about the future, and Noah's probably said this many times as well, so of you, Ariella, I'm sure, the future actually doesn't exist. We can't go there. We can't, you know, visit it and take a lot of measurements about it. It's pluralistic. 
It's uncertain. It's variable. Um, I can't decide on my own what it's going to be. I have to negotiate th that through dialogue, and our negotiated dialogue is what leads us to the future. So about 10, 15 years ago, I was working on a project with the Australian Academy of Sciences, and the question that we had was, how might science inform the future? Like, what is knowable about the future? Um, we went through a range of processes, and actually, you know, there are some things that are kind of knowable. Climate change modelling helps us know what is kind of knowable. Population models help us find out what is kind of knowable. Um, and we, we went through a whole series of scenarios and, and thinking about things, and then we got to the point where we said, how do we actually move this forward? How do we make sure that what we, you know, we're actually thinking about what Australia's going to look like in 2050? And the only way we decided that we could do that, um, mostly a bunch of scientists, was by negotiating the future with a wide range of stakeholders. And so we set up this process um, looking at archetype scenarios and um, engaging people in, in like a world cafe sort of conversation movement where they could talk about each of those archetype scenarios. So the four key archetype scenarios are growth, everything gets bigger, we grow faster, there's more success, but there's also more pollution, you know, everything is expansionary. Um, a restraint scenario, you know, we rein ourselves in, we regulate, we go on diets, we use less energy, that sort of momentum. A catastrophe or collapse scenario where everything goes to shit. And then finally, a transformation scenario where there is something that is really underlyingly different in the, in the, in the things that we might do. Um, and so that we, we had been working with the Academy of Sciences on this process and really sort of refining this way where we could engage people in dialogue around these different archetype scenarios to explore what possible futures might look like. Around about the same time I did this, I think I did something for Suman, which was um, a defence innovation capability forum. And it was a one-day forum out at Mawson Lakes, um, looking, you know, starting to look ahead at the, you know, the collapse of the car industry and the emergence of defence. And I facilitated a forum where we looked at a bunch of possible scenarios and we got people talking about all of the different aspects of what might happen. And often as a futurist, you don't get to know, <laughs> you don't get to know the outcome of those scenarios. You hope that you've sparked something. Um, but last year I had somebody who was at that forum come to me and say, because of that forum, um, a bunch of small um, enterprises were able to band together around a specialty in titanium and titanium products to be able to now sell into large um, places like Lockheed Martin. Um, and so for me, those two stories are really important about, about foresight and about awareness, that often this work is long-term. Often it's a conversation you've had, negotiating it with someone 10 years ago that might actually give you action. That's very, like, tangible. Um, but often it is those conversations. And so I think, you know, that's one of the themes that is emerging is, is a lot of the stuff that Ashley and Ariella have talked to you about so far. It's not the report. It's not the analysis. Those things are important, but they're not everything. What's important is the conversation and the shared visioning. And so last year, Suman said, come and do something with me. I want us to think about what defence is going to need in 50 years. And actually, defence is very good at thinking about that. They do a lot of forward planning and a lot of backcasting, but it's from a defence perspective. And what Suman wanted to do was to sort of say, if we're putting this defence um, forward casting into a world, what does the world look like? And how do we start to think about the world? And so um, she was very brave. And I think that's the second thing I wanted to touch on was really what makes a good client. And I've come to reflect that, you know, from my time working into state government, I found the people who would hire a futurist as opposed to a strategist or a facilitator were people who were brave and people who were kind of happy to be pirates, as Noah said. Um, and interestingly enough, they were both very, very structured. They wanted outcomes. Um, you know, they wanted to see action. And they were also very flexible. They were willing to be imaginative. They were willing to be creative. They were willing to say, hang on, what's that? Let's, let's look into that a little bit more. Um, and they were willing to kind of protect the foresight work, work um, until it had found its feet, until we had found the outcome of it. So there's a famous law of future studies which says for an idea about the future to be useful, first it should appear to be ridiculous, otherwise you're just doing the same old thinking that you've always done. And so in my current job, I have the great privilege of being able to be ridiculous all the time because I'm working in a university, I'm not working in government, um, I am working with young people who demand risk of us, 
But I think to Suman's great credit, the Defence Innovation Scenarios Project also allowed us to be ridiculous. And so um, I'm just going to show you a little glimpse. Um, we looked at the growth scenario. We had um, live graphic recording for those conversations to capture the ideas. You can see some of these tensions in the growth scenario. People didn't want unfettered, unethical growth. So it was really tricky to kind of think through how that might work. There was a lot of data, a lot of monitoring, um, a lot of knowledge sharing, um, kind of expanding ourselves into space. Everything was growing. <coughs> Out of that, we also developed a range of illustrations and scenario titles. So the growth scenario became the Blue Sky Alliance. You can just see a little glimpse of that, you know, growth in education, growth in space mining, growth in healthcare, growth in genetic data, all of those sorts of things. Um, and then we also, th we also went f further than that. We, we developed letters and diary entries to help bring this world to life. Um, we developed products. This one is my favourite. Um, I'm not sure if you can read that, um, but it basically is your subscription to um, the life plan for your mum is about to expire. Do you want to preserve her digital self? She's obviously passed away, but you now have this Amazon subscription to allow you to speak with her as a digital artefact because everything is growing. We never finish anything. Um, and so this combination of being able to illustrate and interrogate through, through graphics, being able to produce little products and diary entries is what has been created for the DIP 2070 scenarios. Um, at MOD in April, we'll actually bring this to life through a little mini exhibition. So in, again, instead of reading the report, which is, has been done, um, you can actually immerse yourself in each of these little mini scenarios and start to, start to ask questions about what does the world look like. And then you're saying, well, what, what's Suman going to do with these big scenarios? The challenge then is to say, OK, now we step into those scenarios, who's marginalised? Where are the threats? Where are we seeing the need for security and safety and defence? And then pairing that back up with the defence forward scenarios and saying, what have we missed? Um, because we're going to have missed things if we're only thinking about things from the one perspective. So I just thought that was a nice little example to kind of remind ourselves that, um, you know, three things. Conversations like this are really important, and conversations like this have tangible outcomes in 10 years' time. I can't underestimate the importance of that. Secondly, when you're doing good foresight work, especially if it's, if it's coming into where you are, be brave, be flexible, be creative, be prepared to be ridiculous for a little while, um, and also demand that something hits action. Um, and, then, and then finally, you know, keep working together to, to try and do that imagining and to try and pull that forward into something that you really want to work towards. Thank you very much. Excellent. So hopefully you're starting to get a bit of a flavour now. We need to be bold, sexy, participatory, ridiculous. We're still, on the, we're still, we're still with us? Great. Because now it's your turn. Um, we're actually going to have a bit of an exercise. There's obviously dozens of things you can do in the foresight space. We've only got time to have a bit of a play with one of those exercises. But I'm going to get Ariella to come back up on stage. And um, yeah, we're going to run a bit of an exercise. If you have got questions for any of the speakers, make a note. We will hopefully um, have time at the end for a quick whip around with the panel. Ariella, over to you. OK, so you're going to get two to three minutes of reflection on your own first. You've got pens and paper on the table. The first step is just alone, think about what do you think are the most both important and uncertain. There are some things that are really important but that might not be that uncertain. So we're looking for the things that are really important and really uncertain in that we don't know how they're gonna turn out in South Australia. So for example, autonomous vehicles are on the horizon. We don't know how they're going to play out here in South Australia. And if you can think about which ones you think are the most important and perhaps write down your top five over the next two to three minutes and then we'll have a discussion on each table about that and then we're going to use Mentimeter to create a shared set of critical uncertainties for South Australia from everyone that's here in the room today. So, Go ahead. Okay, that's time. There's really no right or wrong answers. You know, you might have been thinking about what will be happening to my kids or grandkids and what is it that keeps me up at night about that? Um, could have been any, anything. 
So now um, we have, our speeches did go a little bit over time, so we'll have slightly less time for the table discussion. We'll just spend 10 minutes uh, sharing what came to you during that reflective period with the people on your table. This is a QR code which will take you to a Mentimeter, which will allow each of you to enter your top three based on what you were thinking, but also the discussions that you've just had. Now, what do you think are the really top three critical uncertainties that will shape the future of South Australia out to 2050? I'll leave the QR code up for the next three minutes and then uh, we'll switch so that you can see the word cloud that is emerging from everything that everyone's entering. But just from me looking at that word cloud and, and which things became the biggest, which is a very kind of finger in the air indicator of things that were most frequently mentioned in the word cloud. Um, Climate and climate change and climate impacts are huge. Education, huge. AI, food, housing's massive, geopolitics, biodiversity. And I guess, you know, we've got AI and artificial intelligence. If you combine those, they'd, they'd be even bigger. And same with climate change and climate. Aging population, well-being, mental health, cyber security. There's so many things. Um, this is actually a rich source of data, so um, just be completely honest, I'm going to keep it. Um, you know, and I think, I hope that when you're looking at that, you're seeing your concerns reflected in that word cloud. This um, step of thinking about what would, what would be the critical uncertainties that would shape the future of, of a focal topic, and, and in this case it's just the future of South Australia, because we're all um, involved in South Australia in some way when we're in this room. Um, that's the first step in, in the process of developing scenarios. So you've learnt one step in a foresight process. And we've managed to get back on track with time. So I'll pass back to Brenton. Excellent. Thank you, Ariella, for the exercise and for the time rescue. Um, I'm going to ask the panellists to come and sit up the front. This is your chance to ask some questions or to generate a bit of discussion, debate. Um, we are all quite robust individuals. We like a little bit of controversy. So if you've heard something you disagree with violently or you think that's just not plausible in the South Australian public sector context and you'd like to pull us up on it, um, now's the time to ask the questions. We're going to get some roving mics. Is there anyone who's already been diligent? Yes, we've got a hand up over there. I'll take a few. We've got one there. We've got one there, one there, one there. Excellent. Got a pipeline, that's what we want. So over on the. Oh, okay, yep. Got enough? Oh, okay, yep. Uh, yep. Thanks, Kristen. Yeah. You can be our rov roving commentator if you like as well, Kristen. Yeah, and then I'll just add things <laughs> in as I like. <laughs> Please. Firstly, thank you. That was so interesting and stimulating. Noah, with the project that you were involved with in Dubai, how did you measure the human footprint of what you did? Um, and did you see that the imprint went, was reduced or increased or? Can, can you elaborate? It's a good question. Can you elaborate a little more what you mean by human footprint? Environmental please? impact of the way that uh, of the technology and the way you started to build um, and develop the area? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I should say that only probably a third of the projects we did were in any way technology related. Um, I just used a couple there because they're sort of easy examples to share. But uh, just, before I, just before I left, we did a big impact assessment, impact report, and it was primarily geared at looking at the what I 
a different way of looking at human uh, footprint in terms of the number of people who had been trained in our programs or the number of jobs that had been created, the number of the amount of contribution to the GDP, these sorts of things. Um, I don't think I've seen a carbon accounting specifically, if that's, if that's your, your main focus, but I can say that uh, we, for example, in the accelerator program that we put together, which was a public sector accelerator program where we brought all the different government departments together and then had worked with them to develop challenges that they were trying to address and then brought innovative companies, large and small there, to do uh, pilot projects with them. I would say probably a third of which were related to sustainability in particular, just things that come to the top of my mind. Simple things like little devices you could attach to the outside of your air conditioning unit that would spray mist and reduce the uh, energy usage by 40-50%. Bigger things like carbon capture from the atmosphere, bigger, bigger things like solar desalination plants. We have one of the world's largest solar desalination plants which kind of came through one of our accelerators in its prototype form. But I've never seen an explicit uh, carbon accounting um, of that, so good question. Thank you. Um, thank you, yes, in the middle? Yep, and then we'll come over to there. Um, my name's Leisha, uh, Noah, I have a question for you. I'm you want to say where you're from as well, just maybe yeah. because it yeah. might help with departmental context. Sure, yeah. I'm from OCPSE, which is the Office of the Commissioner for Public Sector Employment. <laughs> say that five times fast. Um, I'm also a former resident of Dubai, and um, I, I'm interested in your thoughts on the psychology um, of how future foresight is successful in a place like Dubai because it attracts a certain type of person, right? They're, it's mainly expatriates. It's 95%, I think, the last time I checked, are expatriates. They're risk takers by nature. They're open to new ideas. Um, you know, but like sometimes when I drive home from work when I was living in Dubai, the suddenly the freeway had changed and the exit no longer existed and I had to drive another 20 minutes to get home and it was kind of just accepted. Whereas if that happened here, you could imagine what that would have been like. Yeah. So I'm interested in um, the psychology of what makes this successful and do you think that westernised democracies are going to have what it takes? Wow, okay, um, great question. I think there's a couple of dimensions to that. There's definitely a flywheel effect, right? As I mentioned in the beginning, even when there were very, very few people in Dubai or the UAE, it was a place which within, you know, like my friends' lifetimes, my friends' fathers grew up in mud huts, you know, not all of them, but effectively. So it's in, had famines and things. So it's a place which, where there's a lived experience of dramatic transformation, not always for the better, you know, lots of ups and downs. And so I think at the leadership level, there was a, an inherent um, not just comfort with uh, uncertainty or, or, or volatility, but an experience that if you also look at some of the neighboring countries and cities, um, the only way to respond to that kind of dramatic volatility is, is by embracing it, right? Being very, taking, making big bets and taking big risks. And that flywheel, those bets, some of those bets were successful. I mean, if I were to look at all of the projects I was involved in, I mean, we probably have 40% 40, 40 of which I would say were successful. You know, 10% of which were very, very, very successful. Um, the rest we learned something from or tried it out. Um, but that sort of flywheel contributes to itself and it builds on itself. So, so there's part of the political culture, which is very, uh, very neophilic, very sort of change, change comfortable. And then that attracts risk takers and people trying to do new things. And part of the the political messaging which we developed over the last 10, 12 years was that if you are one of those kinds of people, right, you are deeply concerned about our agriculture and our food system, and you want to develop lab-grown meat, for example, well, that's a highly regulated industry, as are all of the sectors that are needing transformation that our lives depend on. So where are you going to test that out? There are very few jurisdictions which will allow that, not to mention encourage that and welcome you and enable you to do that. So there was an explicit positioning where we tried to attract those people who were trying to build a better version of the future, whatever that looked like. And so that flywheel continues. Um, I think that is orthogonal to this question of sort of representative democracy. You know, can something like this work in, in, in democratic contexts? Um, because there are, are many case studies which you could explore where you had relatively centralized uh, and hierarchical control in government that did not go down this pathway, you know, the tra classic resource trap. And then you can look at the democratic context. There are some examples that are very, very innovation um, friendly and strong. 
and have a history of adapting to dramatic change, and there are many that haven't. I think the underlying question is probably one around culture. You know, this conversation has come up in, all the, in almost every talk and workshop that I've been in this week with acad academia, private sector, a bit of civil society, other government departments. Um, there's a sense that like Adelaide is really, really comfortable. It's a really nice place to be. Um, and there is a, a, a lot of, everyone knows each other, these two degrees of separation. So there's a lot of potential, very high quality talent, lots of ambition, lots of, of energy to change. But everyone is sort of waiting for the other person to take the first move, you know? I, I heard people in government complaining that they are too constrained and they need somebody from academia to help them give them ideas or someone in private sector to do projects. And then I heard private sector at, waiting for government to give them permission to do it. And then I heard academia being like, oh, you know? So I think that, I think that there is perhaps, because it's so comfortable here, there's less of an, you could argue need historically, but um, to be that, that risk philic, um, but all the capability is there. You know? It just means you actually have to be willing this, to support politicians who are willing to take risks and fail, because you know? that's the benefit of a representative democracy is that you know, at the end of the day, if, if you don't like them, you can boot them out, but, the, but your leaders, your, your CEs and your ministers and are only going to respond to things which they think have degree of, of popularity at first, and the, but that flywheel starts to Build. So your job is to secretly build campaigns of popularity using partners on the stage and using civil society groups and using lots of media to like build the momentum and excitement around these things so that your bosses are like, oh, that's pretty popular. I don't think I'll get fired if I, if I approve that project. And I mean, oh, you can jump in, sorry. Oh, um, I was gonna say that even though the Emirates is this very risk philic situation, there are definitely other contexts where foresight has a lot of relevance where it's a, a risk averse situation and like so the the entry points to being interested in futures and foresight can almost be the opposite ends of the spectrum i mean i spent three years on the shell scenario team and the um sort of mantra that jeremy bentham used while i was there was minimizing maximum regrets you know and if you look at the countries around the world that have institutionalized strategic foresight it's singapore finland the Emirates Estonia. and Estonia and, and us, you know, okay, and we don't all have the same risk appetites. So it's not just about, the risk appetite is what allows you to experiment and learn fast. But there's, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to do the foresight. We don't have to have that risk appetite to just start doing the foresight. Thank you, next question. Is this what? Yeah. yeah. Um, my name is Caroline, I'm from uh, Defence SA. And I have start, I've been working in South Australian government and federal government probably for the past 30 years of my life. I've dedicated most of it to that um, sector just because I believe in the government. Uh, I guess my question is for South Australian government. I work in an innovative department. We are trying to get jobs into SA and I love what we do. They've changed my life that that whole team, and I've worked in a lot of different sectors in SAGov. But what do you think we could improve on? Because to know where we're going, we have to know what we've probably not been so great at, even though it's not a very comfortable conversation. I think we should be having that kind of conversation to be able to admit what we need to do to improve. But it's not to, in vain. That question is to say, let's look where, can we look where we're going? Like, what can we do? And what have we done well? It's a big um, question. Sorry, there's so it, much to it. It's a big Thank question. You. It's a big question. I might even have a crack at that one, if that's okay, um, in the interest of time. Because um, I've been very interested in South Australia's historical role in sort of public and social innovation. And, and I do, and we've talked about this a few times this week. Um, South Australia, in a, in a sense, kind of has this dual personality. We actually have some periods of you know, small c conservatism, where trying to get anything done is really hard. And then we have these moments of really breakout innovation when we do something that the rest of the country or the rest of the world goes, oh my God, where did that come from? I think the challenge for us is, is kind of how do we recognize those different modes and, and adapt and, and navigate those um, so that we can extend those windows of opportunity and then we can fast track our way through those periods of, of sort of uh, inertia and, and um, 
and conservatism, small c conservatism. I think part of the sort of the, the techniques you've seen here today are just different ways of opening up the conversation so we bust out of that complacency. I mean, if you saw that word cloud, if you put that word cloud in front of uh, the cabinet, in fact, there's a, there's, a different, there's a different list out there at the moment. The World Economic Forum just came out with the, their global risk report for 2035. The top 10 risks for the next two years and the next 10 years. And I put it in front of the Premier and I said, the list on the, the right-hand side, the 10-year, that's basically what the world's going to be talking about for the next 10 years. It's the first time I've looked at that list and gone, that's not just like probability like, or possibility. That's, that's like kind of near certainty. So look at that list and think about everything that you want to do and how is that going to play out if that's the, the international and external environment um, that we're going to be operating through. So for me, how do we bust out of those sort of that inertia period? How do we give ourselves a reason to break out of complacency? And how do we really lean into that muscle memory we've got about, about being a really, really innovative state? And it genuinely does have that reputation uh, around, the, around the world in different areas, different sectors, and so on. So I think, I think there is a very, very positive role uh, for us to play in that. Yeah, we're getting that name in defense, we're getting that name in AI, we're getting that name in renewable energy, in space, a whole bunch of areas. Um, and so the trick is how do we sort of really sort of capitalize on that? And now in Indigenous Affairs, as I mentioned at the start, it's a really, really interesting time for us to be back at the forefront of democratic innovation. Um, I'm conscious of time. That's flashing at us. Um, is there I anyone just, who has a final question? I yes. just said one more with the yeah, microphone yep. here. That's OK. Go for it. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work with Art South Australia. Um, each of you mentioned storytelling and how important it is. And um, I wondered whether you could give those of us in the room who have been trained to write reports and um, deal with information in very particular ways, a tip on how to bust out of that and tell good stories. I mean, while, while they're gathering their thoughts, I mean, Arts SA, we talk about like having global reputation, you know, global reputation in arts and culture and the role of the arts in telling different stories about ourselves and about the, type, the place we inhabit and about our futures, super, super critical. So actually, you know, Arts SA, you know, get commissioned to kind of, you know, bring artists into this conversation. That'd be yeah. my... That, that, that was basically going to be my answer. We don't all have to be good at everything, but even in this room alone, there are people who are good at many different things. And, and you know, I didn't make those videos myself. You know, I didn't do those designs myself. It was, that's that collaborative network with, so it's, it's have, make friends, you know, basically make friends. And, 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 a lot, and I often get this, because again, I know what it's like to get procurement approved and things of that nature and budget cycles and stuff. This doesn't have to cost a dime. That's why the value of big ideas that are really interesting and when you can get those out in public as a conversation piece, that attracts free labor, high talented free labor where people really love what you want to do. And that builds the momentum forward. So make, yeah, make friends, hey, talk to I, media. Can I answer from the back? Yes. Um, I was also going to say, you know, what I said around, um, you know, have chats, go to lunch, have conversations. Like, the way we talk to each other is through stories, and we don't even have to do the, the thinking behind the how am I going to tell a story. you just got to start by talking to people. So I think, you know, less meetings, more wine would be my advice. You go first. You go first. I like Kristen's advice so much. But... Um, <laughs> So when the question was first asked, the reason I had the reaction I had is I actually think it's a more profound question than just the pragmatic storytelling part in the sense that um, I said that over the last year I've been hell for leather doing lots of different scenario processes with so many government agencies about so many topics and there really is a kind of archetype emerging from those processes in terms of there being one of the scenarios that involves a major transformative shift of values that shapes the way these disruptive technologies are implemented, the business models and the governance that shapes them so that um, there seems to always be one scenario that's more on the regenerative side. There is always one scenario that's more on the, um, we're really into innovation, but it's about growth, you know, and... Um, and there's also often a scenario which is a bit like Kristen's collapse one, which is where we really just let um, short-term financial opportunism 
allow things to go to shit. And so um, after every scenario's activity, there's at least one person that says to me, but the values shift in that scenario that we find more positive than the ones where things go to shit. Whose job is it to do something about that? Whose job is that values, culture, creation? And I think the answer is it's all of ours. It doesn't sit with any one government agency. So um, that's why I think that was a really, really profound question. Brilliant, thank you. Could I ask you to thank all of our panelists and all of the speakers for today? Thank you. Um, that's, that's basically it for today. Um, I just have a few minor sort of, um, sort of thoughts on next steps and call to action. You heard Ariella talk about, during her presentation, we do have a community of practice. There will be wine, um, for those of you who like that. Um, there will be products, there will be workshops and opportunities to engage. If you're interested in having us come and talk or there's opportunities to partner with you, they're a bit maxed out at the moment, but we're always happy to sort of start lining up projects further out into the future. Um, keep an eye out for some pieces of work that you can use in your jobs. Um, the work that the team are doing next week on net, net zero scenarios will ultimately become a public document, not just for public servants, but also for the private sector, for SMEs, small business, to really think about what it means for them. So keep an eye out. If you'd like to have a chat to us, you can find us on, on the, the directory. Grab us at the end of today. Um, IPA would be um, upset if I didn't point out there are some other things going on, including an on the couch session with the brand new chief executive of the South Australian Tourism Commission, Emma Terry, which is on the 1st of March. Um, there will be an evaluation form to get your feedback on today's forum. Um, and if you can take the time to give us your thoughts, that will help, South, uh, help IPA ensure that it's fit for, for the future. And I'm just going to leave you with one final quote. Um, we can't have a session on the future without mentioning Buckminster, Buckminster Fuller. And he said, we are called to be architects of the future, not its victims. So with that, have a good day. Thank you very much.